All right, 1 John chapter 5. Of course, we have this very famous passage where I'll be preaching on today is the doctrine of the Trinity. So we're going to be teaching a, a, just a real doctrinal sermon today to get you founded um, just in why we believe in the Trinity and, and where you can find all these scriptural verses to support it and to back it up. We've been running into a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses lately out soul winning. So I feel like this is a pretty important sermon to understand. You know, it's a doctrine that, that they don't buy into, but it's a very key and critical doctrine to, to know. Now, the word Trinity itself, and you have people object to this, say, well, Trinity's not even in the Bible. And you're right. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the entire concept of the Trinity is in the Bible. I have no problems using that word, even though it's not a word found in the Bible. Instead of the Trinity, was tri, tri means three. If you have a tricycle, there's three wheels, right? Tri means three. Trinity just means three. Really what it means is the three in one. And if you look at 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7, the Bible says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So instead of saying three are one as a biblical term, we say Trinity. And everybody understands what that means. So I have no problem using a word that's not found in the Bible to explain this because it's absolutely 100% valid and a true word to use to describe this doctrine. Now, a lot of people have a hard time with this. And we, the last, last week when we ran into those Jehovah's Witnesses, the, there was a young, a young man or an older boy. He, um, he said, you know, I just don't quite understand how you can have this, this three gods but one God. Like he, did, he, he didn't get it. And I will admit that it, it might not be easy to understand. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16, it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So in 1 Timothy 3.16, it says, look, without any controversy, look, there is, you know, the mystery of godliness is great. There's a mystery surrounding the Trinity. And, and, here's, and that's what this verse is talking about because he says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Talking about Jesus Christ being God manifest as a human being, God in the flesh, God incarnate. And that word incarnate means in the flesh. If you think of, of if you know a little bit of Spanish, carne is meat, right? So incarnate is it's the same root word there as carne. Um, it just means in the flesh, okay? And that's what Jesus Christ is. He was God incarnate, God in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. That's who we believe Jesus Christ was. Now we have three, of course, that make this up. In 1 John 5, it says the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. No one seems to have a problem understanding who the Father is. Right? That's, that's all throughout the Bible. Um, people have a tendency to say, you know, we'll say like, well, Jehovah, that's the Father. And, um, but then the Word, we don't see the Word mentioned very often. It is mentioned more than once. But the Word is very clearly talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ, the Son, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Same thing. And the, the, the place where we get that reference from is in John chapter 1. And we're going to get to John 1 in a minute, but um, I'll just quote it for you. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it's talking about the Word. And then later on in the chapter, in, in chapter 1, it says, and the Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father. So it's clearly talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right? That's who the Word is. So when we see this capital W, you know, Word, the Word, it's talking about Jesus Christ. Now, when people have a hard time understanding this concept of three in one, there's a couple examples I like to use. Um, one of them, it, it, because this is all around us anyways, and I have this, maybe I'll jump to that real quick because I want to explain this. Well, I'll get back to that later. But the, the examples that I use to understand this passage Maybe I don't have that in my notes. In Romans chapter 1, it explains, I'm just going to turn there so I could get the, get the reference, the, the, I don't mess it up, but basically, you know, people have no excuse to know God. You know, you might say, well, I don't know anything about God. Well, 
we are without excuse according to the Bible. It says, um, For the wrath of God, Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So it says here, the invisible things of him, talking about God, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. These, these invisible aspects of God are clearly seen. It says, from the creation of the world, being understood by the things that are made, which is us. We understand these things. We were made by God. Um, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. God has given us plenty around us within nature to know that he exists, to know that he is our creator, to know these things, these invisible things of God. And it says to know the Godhead. And that's a point that I was going to get to much later in the sermon, but the Godhead consists of three parts, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So we can see these things in just, just from nature around us. There's so many things that have three attributes. And the one example that I like to use is that of water. Now, water can be, is found in three forms, right? Naturally, it's found in three forms. It could be a liquid. As we know, water, you take a drink of water. It could be a solid in the form of ice, or it can be steam, right? A form of gas. So they're all different from each other. They have different properties. Uh, you know, the, the ice expands when it's frozen. You know, water's fluid, and obviously gas is, is a gas. But um, they all have different properties and uniqueness about themselves, but they're all molecularly made up of the same thing. It's all H2O. Nothing has changed in the composition of, the, of water itself, of the H2O. It's, it's all one, if you will. It's all, like, like we would say, God, Jesus Christ is God, God the Father is God, and, and the Holy Ghost is God. It's all God. Okay? They, have, they definitely have their unique attributes. Now, I want to point this out too, is that we believe these three are one. And it may sound kind of silly, but, but try to understand what I'm saying here. There definitely are three. And there definitely is one. So the reason why I say it is because some people try to just mush them all together into one too much, I guess you could say, is saying like that it's, 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 it's all exactly the same God. Like there's one God, and, and again, it's hard to explain the concept, but God the Father is distinct from God the Son, which is also distinct from God the Holy Ghost. Okay, the three are one, but they, but they definitely have unique attributes. They definitely, you know, Jesus Christ was down here on the earth and praying to God the Father. And this is, this is something that, that oftentimes Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses will bring up and say, see, how can he be God? Yeah. And, and they'll look at that and say, if he's down here, why is he praying to God? Is, was he praying to himself? And in a way, yes, and in a way, no, at the same time. And this is why great is the mystery of godliness. Okay, can I, can I say I can completely explain this perfectly? No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit trying to, 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 to find the words to explain this concept. But Jesus Christ is definitely distinct. I mean, Jesus Christ is not on the throne right now. God the Father is on the throne. The kingdom, when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to be on the throne during the millennial reign of Christ, you know, during that millennial reign. He's going to be the king. He's going to be have all authority. And then it's going to flip back. He's going to refer to it and give back the, the, the throne back unto God the Father. But it's, there's still one God, and there's still all God. It's three different manifestations of God. Um, and we don't want to go too much to the extreme on one end or the other. Because while they are distinct, they are all one. And that's why he says here, the three are one. Um, we see in, you don't have to turn, turn if you would to Colossians chapter 2. 
I'll read for you from Ephesians 4. The Bible says in verse 4, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So there we see there's one God, right? One God and Father. There's one Lord. Yet there's still three parts to that God. Colossians 2, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, take note of some of these verses because they're going to be very useful if you want to show somebody, if you have an opportunity to sit down with someone who doesn't believe in this doctrine of the Trinity, to show them these because the, way, the wording and the way it's written is very important. Look at what we just read there in verse 2. At the, at the latter part, it says, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, comma, and of the Father, comma, and of Christ. It lists off three distinct people there. You say, oh, well, this is the mystery of God and of the Father. That means one thing, but then and of Christ is different. No, the, the way that this is grammatically formed together, this, this list separated by commas, this mystery of God and of the Father and of the Christ is signifying three different things. So it's, it's separating God from the Father, right? Even though they're all, we, we know them all to be God, um, it's talking about a, you know, the mystery of God being separate from the Father and separate from Christ. And we see that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. Flip over to chapter 3 real quick. The Bible says in verse 17, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father, by him. So again, we see here God and the Father. It's, um, there's a separation going on. These are good verses to use to show people, say, well, why would it say that? How do you explain that? How can you, how can you say that there's, there's a separation going on in these words? Um, 1 Thessalonians 3.11, you don't have to turn there, it says, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. So we see this throughout Scripture. This isn't just found in that one verse. Now, that 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, where we turn to, that is probably the most clear, comprehensive verse that you can show anybody. Hey, these three are one. This is talking about three entities, three aspects of God, three manifestations of God, but they're all one God. And it's the most clear verse that we have, which is also why this verse is under so much attack. They're all, like Almost all the new versions, I believe, have this removed. Because they'll say this is not found in reliable manuscripts, this is not found, this shouldn't belong, this doesn't belong in the Bible. So it's no wonder why such a clear, great verse, just like the verse on baptism, right, in Acts chapter 8. It's such a clear verse that says that you have to believe before you're baptized. That's removed. The, the, some of the strongest doctrinal verses are removed. Now, do we still have the concept of the Trinity? Obviously we do. I mentioned, you know, one, two, three, four, five other verses that give you this exact same concept. And that's not, we're not done by any stretch of the imagination. But we've already looked at those that give you the same exact concept. But none are quite as clear and spelled out explicitly as 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 is. Um, Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter number 2. We're going to go back over by 1 John. Now, while there are three aspects to God, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of deal this time this morning dealing with the references about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. There are way more references that prove that Jesus Christ and God are one. So I'm going to spend a lot more time in that because ultimately... That is the big hang-up anyways, is that people don't want to believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. They, don't, they deny the deity of Jesus. And the reason why it's so important is because if you don't have the right Jesus to believe on, then you're not saved. You have to believe the right Jesus. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. We're going to look at, you're in 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse number 22. 
The Bible says, Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. We see here that the two are inseparable. You cannot say, well, I have the Father. I believe in God the Father, but I don't believe in the Son. I don't believe in the Son as being God. You can't have it, but you cannot do that because he says you have to have the Son in order to have the Father. And likewise, it says, he that acknowledges the Son, you have the Father also. One does not come without the other. It's a, it's a complete package. You have to have um, both here is what this is saying. And he says in verse 24, Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Now, um, turn if you go to Revelation chapter 1, just a couple, maybe one or two pages over in your, to the right in your Bible. Revelation chapter 1. Acts 7.59. This is another verse, and, and you know, take note of this. Acts 7.59. You don't have to turn there, but this is in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen was given his... his sermon, if you will. He's talking to the Jews and he's going through this whole history and he's talking about Moses and Abraham you know, and how they were kicked out of Egypt. He's going on and on. And then um, when he mentions Jesus Christ, they killed, they got all mad and angry and they ran on him and they stoned him with stones. At the very end of that chapter, at the end of that story, verse 59 of Acts 7, it says, and they stoned Stephen calling upon God. So who is he calling to? Who is he talking to? God. And look what he says in saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The narrator of the Bible is saying that when they stoned Stephen, he was calling upon God. This isn't even Jesus or Stephen saying, I'm calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus. The narrator of the Bible, the Holy Ghost, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Under the inspiration of God, these words were written that Stephen was calling upon God in saying, Lord Jesus. Do you think he was looking at Jehovah and saying, Lord Jesus, as if it was someone different? You know, No, he was calling on God because Jesus Christ is God. Very powerful verse to show people that one as well. Acts 7.59. But look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, this is, of course, John is in the Isle of Patmos. He's, he's you know, um, been shut up for, for preaching about Jesus. And Jesus appears unto him. Look at verse number eight of John number one, John chapter, excuse me, Revelation chapter one, verse number eight. The Bible says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, I, again, this is, this is going to be a great place to bring Jehovah's Witnesses if they'll listen if they'll receive it, if, if you can get somebody who will have an honest conversation with you. Okay, these are going to be verses to, to help explain the Trinity because these are bulletproof. These are some great passages. Revelation 1.8, again, so we can look at this and say, okay, who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending? It says, saith the Lord. So who's speaking to John according to Revelation 1.8? The Lord, right? And he says, the Almighty. It's important. Because when we bring them to Isaiah 9, 6, and it says, you know, the wonderful counselor, we're talking about all the names of Jesus Christ. This shall be his name, wonderful counselor. Um, it says the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the, ever, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And um, they'll say, well, see, that just says the mighty God, not the almighty, not God almighty, not the almighty God. There's a difference. And they really like to, pit, to point out that difference. Um, I usually will say, well, how many gods do you believe in then? Is Jesus a God? But I'm not quite there yet because that's, that's another point um, that I'm going to get to. But here it says the Almighty. Remember that because we're going to keep reading here. So you can look at verse number 8 and say, okay, well, this, is, this must be God talking to him. And that's what they'll look at. This is Jehovah talking to John. Look at verse number 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle which is called, that is called Patmos, 
for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Same person talking to him because again he repeats, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, which is what he just said in verse number 8. Look at verse number 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So he sees Jesus Christ. Because that's who's talking to him. It's the Son of Man. Jesus Christ is called the Son of God. He's also called the Son of Man. Study it out through the, through the Gospels. He's, he's referred to as both. Jehovah is never referred to as the Son of Man. Jehovah the Lord, in that sense, God the Father. He says, he sees one like unto the Son of Man. <clears throat> And he describes them, verse 14, His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And there are so many attributes. I'm not going to get through all these for time. Look them out in the rest of the book of Revelation. The sword coming out of his mouth. That's Jesus Christ. The sound of many waters is the same attributes of Jehovah God. Okay? Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Okay, same person talking with John this whole time. The Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Look at what he says in verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. So we saw in verse 8, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending. The Lord, the Almighty, in verse 18, the same person I am he that liveth and was dead. Tell me, when was God the Father ever dead? Jehovah's Witness, answer me that. When was Jehovah ever dead? Because Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to save the world from their sins. Jesus Christ was alive. He was dead. And behold, he is alive forevermore. This is Jesus Christ speaking to John. And what attributes does he have? It says here, he was the Lord. It says here, he's the Almighty. It says here, he is Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. Look at chapter number 2. Or I'm assuming chapter 21 of Revelation. Chapter 21. We see that this is Jesus speaking. Revelation 21, same thing, verse number 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The Alpha and Omega, we saw from chapter 1, this is Jesus Christ speaking. And he says, I will be his God, and he shall be, again, how many gods do you believe in? We believe that there's one. There's three manifestations. There's three aspects of God. There's God the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But these three are one. Jesus Christ, now look, this would be extremely blasphemous for Jesus to be speaking all of these things if it weren't true. If he wasn't God. I mean, he, God says that, you know, in the Ten Commandments, say, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And there is no caveat or exception to that. That is the Ten Commandments. And this isn't even in my notes either, but you could also turn to John 
um, I believe it's chapter 20, is Thomas is talking to, to Jesus Christ, and he says, my Lord and my God. And he calls Jesus God, and Jesus doesn't rebuke him. And he says, oh, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe? If Jesus was not God, yet he was sent from God, he would have corrected Thomas. He would not be accepting praise as God. But he did accept the praise because he was God in the flesh. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 44. Because th this is really important to understand these things. Because either there's a contradiction in Scripture and in the Bible, or there's not. I mean... It, without the doctrine of the Trinity, you uh, have blaring contradictions in the Bible. And you have to reconcile them somehow. Isaiah chapter 44. These, Isaiah 43, 44, and 45, I love also, again, if, there's, if someone will give me the time between the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, people who don't believe in the deity of Christ... Very good chapters to go to. Isaiah 9, um, as, you know, verse 6, which gives the name of Jesus. I mean, how can he be the everlasting father? That doesn't even make any sense. Why would that be one of his names? One, one of them said, oh, because, uh, because he's our father or something weird. I said, and, then, and then I said, well, what about Jehovah? I thought he was our father. He says, well, he is. I said, well, how can we have two dads? That doesn't even make any sense. So I have one dad and one mom. How can you have two dads? That's not right. And, and you know, he didn't really have an answer for that, but um, that's what he, that was his try to justification, Jesus being called the everlasting father. It doesn't make any sense unless you believe that these three are one. Um, you're in Isaiah 44. Look at verse number 6. Now, we already saw in Revelation 1, we proved that to be Jesus Christ because he was him that was dead and is alive forevermore, right? He says, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last. Look at verse number 6 of Isaiah 44. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. Huh. That's Jehovah saying he is the first and the last. Yet in Revelation, we have Jesus Christ saying he is the first and the last. Isaiah 44 says, beside me, there is no God because there's one God. How many gods do you believe in? You flip over to chapter 48. Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48, verse 12 Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. Multiple things in this verse. There, there's so, the, the Bible is so dense, and there's so much that, that Scripture that refers to other places. In Isaiah 48, 12, first he says, um, I am he. You can prove this. this is, again, this is Jehovah speaking, the Lord, right? Saying, I am he. Jesus Christ says, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. In John chapter 8, three, at least three times, three or four times in John chapter 8, he says, I am he. Before Abraham was, I am. John chapter 8. Very important to draw these parallels and show them. Say, what do you mean? You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the I am He in order to be saved, in order to have the right Jesus Christ. Yet here in, in Isaiah 48, He says, I am He. And again, we see the first, I also am the last. Again, to go in, in conjunction with Revelation 1. And then he says, Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. Okay? Um, keep that in mind because we're going to look in, a, in just a couple minutes who created heaven and earth. Who cre who's the creator of everything? Um, 
turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1. Because here we saw Jehovah saying, Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. Actually, turn, if you would, to John 1 first. We're going to go to Colossians 1 as well. If you want to put a finger or a bookmark in Colossians 1, we're going to be going there next. Turn to John 1 first. See how many more points I got. I, there's a lot. There's a lot of scripture on this doctrine and on this subject, and I want to try to make sure I get to everything. And and this isn't even comprehensive. I, I got a lot of good points here to prove this doctrine and lots of scripture that that you have to have an answer for these things. Scripture can't be broken. Scripture cannot be broken. You, you, can, you, you know, either there's contradictions and it's not God's word, or you have to understand this properly with the right doctrine. Sit. You're in John chapter 1. Look at verse number 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now in that New World Translation, it says there, and the word was a God. This is also a place I like going back between Isaiah 43, 44, and 45 because I, he says, I, I, even I am the Lord and beside me there is no God. Beside me there is no Savior. Yet, they say here that the Word was a God. Okay, well then how do you reconcile Isaiah 43 that says, or Isaiah 44, which we already read, I am the first and I am the last and beside me there is no God. With John, one in their Bible that says the Word was a God doesn't make any sense. The word has to be God, which is what was originally written anyways. Um, not their false perversion of the Bible. But John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Look at this. Talking about the word. The word is the subject of what we're reading here. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So we saw in Isaiah 48, Jehovah saying, Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. And now we see in John chapter 1, the Word is the one who's credited with making everything. Without him was not anything made that was made. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Man, I should have had you keep a finger in Isaiah because we're going back there again too. There's so much. I don't like skipping over these and it's important to kind of see these for yourself. But um, we're going to be going back to Isaiah 45 after Colossians 1. Colossians 1, look at verse number 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So the subject matter here is his dear Son. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Verse number 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. No doubt, this is talking about Jesus Christ, for by him were all things created. Isaiah 45, verse 11 says, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the works of my hands. Command ye me, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. God saying with his own hands he stretched out the heavens. He's the one that created the earth. Yet we see in two places in the New Testament giving Jesus, crediting Jesus Christ with that, um, with that feed, with the task of creating everything. Isaiah 45 verse 18 says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens... God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. 
So either you have a contradiction or Jesus Christ has to be God as is stated in John chapter 1, as is stated in 1 John chapter 5, among many other places, 1 uh, Timothy 3.16. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And it talks about Genesis 1, the account, God creating everything, right? But then look at Genesis chapter 1, Lord. Yeah, go ahead and turn to um, Colossians chapter 2. Because in Genesis chapter 1, as it goes through the whole creation account, it says in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So he's talking about the plural, let us make. It's kind of interesting. Why would God say, let us make man in our image? Who else is created in the image of God besides man. There's no other creation. There's none of the beasts, because people say, oh, well, you know, he's saying, you know, because who else would he be talking to that's in the same image of God, right? Doesn't say that the angels were made in the image of God. It doesn't say that anybody else was created in the image of God. Man was created in the image of God. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So first God is talking in the plural sense and then he's talking in the singular. It says, let us make man after, after our image and then God made man after his image. Because they're interchangeable, because the Godhead consists of three parts. He's an us and an I at the same time. Great is the mystery of God. It's, 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 it's amazing, but that is what the Scripture teaches. And without having that understanding, you have contradictions in the Bible, flat out. You're in Colossians chapter 2. We're going to look at this. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Colossians 2, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So this is saying God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, right? Galatians chapter 1. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 2. You're in Colossians 2, turn to John chapter 2. Galatians 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So Galatians 1.1 1, 1 says, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And honestly, I've just shown you a couple places there, but there are multiple places, and actually just about all of them are the ones that are attributing God the Father with raising, God raised Jesus from the dead. Over and over again, you find that. But look at what Jesus Christ himself said in John chapter 2. Because we know that Jesus Christ was not a liar. We know that Jesus Christ was without sin, according to the Bible. John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Did he say, and in three days God will raise it up? The Father will raise it up. He says, I will raise it up. And just so that we understand what he's talking about here when he says, destroy this temple, verse number 20, then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple and building and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. His body. Jesus Christ said, destroy this body, this temple, which was his body. And in three days, I will raise it up. On the third day, Jesus raised up his body. Yet God is always attributed with raising up Jesus' body because Jesus and God are one. John chapter 3. You're in John chapter 2. Slip over John chapter 3. Verse number 13 says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, when we die, and I've gone over this, in, I think, in this study on John chapter 3, we're carried by the angels into heaven when we die. We see that with um, Elisha. Elijah was carried by a chariot into heaven. We see that with um, 
Enoch was taken. You know, all these people were, were, were are transported. They don't ascend on their own into heaven. You know, you know, when you die, you're not just going to be like, I'm going to heaven. Right? We don't have that power. Because people who would be destined to hell then would be like, I'm going to heaven and ascend up to heaven. Right? You can't do that. We're, we're brought there. We're taken there. Jesus Christ did. That's why it says that no man hath ascended up to heaven. That doesn't mean no one has ever been to heaven, which the false uh, perversions of the Bible will say there. No man hath ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. He, can ascend, he ascended up to heaven, and it says which is in heaven. So while Jesus, and this is Jesus Christ speaking, mind you. We're reading these words in a book. Jesus Christ said that, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. He was on this earth speaking these words, and he says that he basically is in heaven while he's on this earth. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 4. Because now we're going to see, okay, Jesus Christ, we know he's not a liar, yet he said that he was going to raise himself. Yet we see in other places that God raised him from the dead. Romans chapter 4, this is important too. Who do we need to believe in order to be saved? Obviously, we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ, right? Look at Romans chapter 4, verse number 20. The Bible says, He staggered not at the promise of God, talking about Abraham, through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So he's saying here, it's imputed for righteousness if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord. He's talking about God the Father that raised up Jesus our Lord. He's saying if we believe on him. My favorite verse in the Bible, John 5, 24. Jesus Christ himself said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, so who sent Jesus? God the Father, right? Believe on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So if you put your faith in Jehovah God, he says you're saved. But in John 6, verse 47, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The reason why is because, as we saw earlier, you can't have the Son without the Father, and you can't have the Father without the Son. If you are truly putting your faith in Jehovah, if you're trusting Him, you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ because they're one. You can't have the Father and not the Son. Otherwise, you're not saved. That's why these Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and all these other cults that don't believe that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh are not saved. Because they think they have the Father and they don't have the Son. If they don't have the Son, they don't have the Father. Now, I already, I already went to um, Romans chapter 1. We saw there the, the God's eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Last place I'll have you turn is Colossians chapter 2. We will see this other reference to the Godhead, which is really what we're talking about this morning, this doctrine of the Godhead, the Trinity, the three in one. Colossians 2, verse 6 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus Christ dwells God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He says, all the fullness of that Godhead bodily, in the body, incarnate. And finally, in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. God doesn't share His glory with anybody. That's why the Ten Commandments are so explicit about not having any other gods, not even these false gods, not these idols. Don't bow down to them. Don't worship them. Yet time after time after time, God is giving glory to His Son, Jesus Christ. 
We see here Jesus Christ commanding them to baptize people. Hey, in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, in the name of God the Holy Spirit. He says, this is what you need to do. They all get glory because they're all three God in one. And I forgot to mention, okay, so that last, I, I totally skipped over this, but let's cover it now. I'm going to go to James chapter 2 since this is a place where they like to go anyways to um, talk about faith without works is dead. Um, this will help you to explain the concept of the tree. We'll close on this point. I already told you about water. Water is a, a pretty good example, but it's not the best example. I, think, I actually prefer this example to water um, as trying to explain the Trinity, trying to explain how this can be. How can this be possible? The Bible says that um, where is it? Uh, verse 26, James chapter 2, the last verse. The last verse. Verse 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So now we see a definition of death in the Bible. Physical death. When your body is separated from your spirit, the Bible says that your body's dead. Okay? We have three parts that we consist of. We have a body, obviously a flesh. We have a spirit, and we also have a soul. All three of those parts make up who you are. They are all you. So if you were to go to a funeral or a wake, right, and there's, there's a corpse, there's a body, you would be recognizing that person as whoever that person was. Right? That's their body. That's, that was them. Yet, when they're separated, you can say that body, is, like if, well, if I were to die today, if I were to fall over and collapse, my body would be like, wow, that's David Burzens right there. And then they'd be looking at my body. But my spirit, if I was dead, my spirit would be separated from my body. Now my spirit would be David Burzens also. Right? And my soul is David Burzens. And later on, of course, I'm going to get a new body. And the three are going to be one again, except it'll be a, a perfect body. And not any one is more me than the other. They're all me, but they're all different. My soul isn't the same as my spirit, which isn't the same as my flesh. They're three different parts that, that make up who I am, yet it's all one person. Right? I'm only one person. Just because I have a soul, spirit, and a body doesn't mean I, I'm three people. I'm one person, but there's three parts. God is one God, but he consists of those three parts. Now, if you separate God the Father and God the Son, it doesn't mean God is dead. It means, in this illustration, my body would be dead without the spirit, but there's still those same three parts. God has those three parts as well. And I think that that is... Sit down. I think that that is a much better explanation to maybe help us to comprehend. And it's all throughout nature. There's so many things. You know, we have time, space, and matter. You have, you know, all throughout science, you're going you're gonna to find this, this trinity, so to speak, within, um, within creation, within life itself. And um, if we just open our eyes, we can see this, isn't, this really isn't an extremely difficult concept to grasp. Do I understand all the ins and outs of it? No, not perfectly. But I know enough of it, and we see enough of it in nature to believe it, and to know that if it says it in God's word, we know that it's true. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for... Um, teaching us this doctrine of the Trinity. Lord. I pray that you please help us to be able to show this to others, that, that, that this might be a stumbling block for them, dear Lord. Help us not to get caught up in vain disputes and, and arguments, but um, for those that, that, that really are interested in, in learning or discussing or open to, to changing their beliefs, these people that have, been, that have been brainwashed by these cults, dear Lord, into not believing in your Son, 
as, as being God in the flesh. Um, Lord, I pray that you please help us to, to be able to show these people their errors and um, help us to know, the, to know your word better, to know the Bible, to be able to turn to these passages that we looked at today as evidence to show them that, that hey, they can either believe your words or they can reject your words. But help us to be, to be good servants and workers of yours to be able to show people these words. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.